All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Just another reminder that we are recording this, and so if you ever need to come back to this as a reference, it's always going to be available for you. Today we're continuing our series on endpoints with the TOUC, and we're going to start talking about some third-party devices. Today we're going to be talking about the voice operator panel, uh, including a, a live uh, setup of a new panel uh, so that you can see how you configure it, how you build it, and all of that. Uh, we're going to be giving an overview of it, when it might be the right fit for your customers, what you need to know about licensing it. We're gonna, like I said, we're going to do an initial setup. Then I'm going to go through the basic operations, making calls, receiving calls, transferring calls, and finalizing with a touch on customization. As always, as we go through this, there'll also be time for questions at the end. So if there's anything you need, please feel free to raise your hand, put it in the chat. We want to make sure that we're here to address anything that uh, comes up. All right, so let's go ahead and just start with a brief overview of what this does today. So the voice operator panel is a uh, operator and receptionist focused soft phone that's been in development since uh, 2008 from a company called Joher um, out of uh, France. It's highly focused on that operator style mode with a major um, support for multiple directories and integrations to make someone who's handling a large number of calls to make their, their life easier. Um, we've tested and validated this against the UC and have been supporting deployments with this for years, which is part of the reason why we're handling it a little differently than other third party devices. Uh, because we've done so much validation on this and because we're able to support this directly, uh, we can support from both the sales aspect and a uh, technical and deployment aspect. We can directly support as West Telcom, as opposed to having to always point back at the uh, the vendor for support here. Uh, it's, it's built for Windows 7 or later. Um, Today we'll actually be bringing it up on a Windows 11 VM. So from something that, uh, you know, a five, six year old machine up to current uh, shouldn't be an issue for running on most people's systems. It's highly customizable. I just grabbed a few screenshots here for uh, to give you a, an example of it. All three of these, whether it's a high density um, with a focus on call logs and just as much information as you can cram in or a more contact focused view or even a compressed view. These are all supported deployable methods within that same voice operator panel. It gives you a lot of flexibility in how you deploy it, <clears throat> and it gives the users a lot of flexibility to tailor it to their needs. This can be great because it means that they're only getting the information they want. We can really work with our customers to make sure that it's really fine-tuned for their operations and what they're doing. The downside of this, is, and as with anything that's highly customizable, is sometimes you'll go through a few iterations before you find that right fit. So always want to stress that and keep that in mind as we're going through and discussing uh, the voice operator panel or anything that's highly customizable. Um, it's very quick, very easy to set up and get your basics going, but uh, you get a power user in there and there's going to be little tweaks that they might be making for some time. Um, just the nature of, of the product as we bring through here. Um, target customers are going to be ones that have high call volumes and that prefer a live answer over an auto attendant in most cases. Um, the other thing to look for as well is that we're looking for something where there's a large number of potential destinations. So if you've got a, um, a an operator group or a reception group who they're receiving a large number of calls, but they might only be transferring to two or three different departments, and they're always transferring to a hunt group or an ACDQ or something like that. Um, the voice operator panel will still absolutely work for them, but it may not necessarily be the perfect fit because you're not having a lot of destinations. You don't have as much information to manage there. Uh, this would be much more of a case where you're coming into that um, receptionist or operator role and that person is needing to transfer to a large number of different individuals, whether that's directing customers to the appropriate sales rep or the appropriate project manager or um, support team or clinician in a healthcare environment. Um, 
when you're working with something like that, where you're juggling you know, dozens or potentially hundreds of different destinations, and you want to make that available for um, for those operators, this is a place where you can really see a lot of efficiencies here. Um, one example is an early deployment we did with this um, had a single um, dedicated operator who we had to make some changes to the UC itself to support because she was processing so many calls throughout the day. She would uh, routinely have managed 500 plus calls by lunchtime. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's the expectation for anybody there, um, that you've got to be very quick, very fast, and very energetic in order to handle that, no matter what tool you're working with. But um, the higher the call volume, the more this makes sense. Um, and it really only makes sense if you've got that dedicated operator position. So if you've got a calls coming in and they go to a hunt group and one of 20 people gap, grabs it as they're able, um, otherwise it times out to an auto attendant. Um, certainly again, this could work for them, but much more commonly this is going to be your job is to handle inquiries, handle calls and get them to the right place. And that's where this is gonna really shine. With licensing, this is licensed a little differently from uh, first party products. The first is that it's a per device license by default, uh, which means it's linked to the MAC address. When you install the voice operator panel, it gives you a 30 day grace period. And then to continue using it after that point, you have to have provided a license key. That license key is generated based off of the MAC address for the uh, network interface that the voice operator panel is using for its uh, voice traffic. Uh, once it's locked in, it is a perpetual license. There's no additional support charges or anything else that comes into play outside of our standard uh, system support, but uh, it does get locked down there. It is movable for um, if necessary, but that requires working out to us so that our support team can uh, manually transfer that license to a new MAC address. Um, it is not an automated process, and if you're going to ever need to move the voice operator panel from one deployed system to another, uh, make sure that you have the MAC address of both the old and the new system so that we can expedite uh, that translation for you or that transfer for you. If you are looking at a deployment where this is going to be a lot more portable, there is an optional USB dongle that instead of deploying with a, a single MAC address uh, requires that a USB uh, drive be plugged in to the machine that is running the voice operator panel. This can be very useful for cases where uh, it's moving throughout the day or you just want some more flexibility. There is a little bit of additional cost simply to cover the fact that you're going from software to having to ship equipment around, um, but it is there as an option for you. Um, on the TO side, we're going to require a user license for it, but we don't require a third party SIP license. Um, we've validated this enough that the um, we trust that user agent, we know what it's going to do, and um, there's no other device management or configuration needed on the UC, just the, the user extension itself. So we're gonna go through quickly on the setup here, show you a little bit about how that operates. So the install and configuration, the first part you need to be aware of is that we're, you can do a branded download directly from uh, the link on here. So that's voiceoperatorpanel.com. And then we have a TO specific build. Uh, this is very similar to the production build. In fact, it um, is something that you can change a, a retail release into just by making a couple configuration changes. Uh, but we find that it's usually easier just to use this link. It'll always grab the right version as opposed to having to, to manually log in and select the correct version and then change branding as necessary. For small scale deployments, and that's generally going to be under five or six users in a system, um, manual configuration is, is our expectation. And that's what we're going to be doing today. For larger deployments, if you've got a case where you know, this is going out to a large number of locations, for example, 20, 30 sites, and each one's going to have one of these, uh, if there's going to be shared and common uh, settings between them, especially around directory integrations, 
we can um, you can bundle that installer with a um, XML configuration file and then just deploy that to each system. Uh, when we are installing this, this can be done either as a single user or system wide. It just is going to depend on uh, the nature of your uh, your customer setup. Uh, single user is the default requires doesn't require administrative privileges, so it's easier to get up, especially if you're not running the uh, rest of your customers IT, uh, but we do support both of those methods. We're going to run through now and I'm going to actually switch over to a live setup of what we've seen here. Uh, so I have just installed uh, the voice operator panel and we're doing a first run run through right now. Uh, when you do install it, you do get a, uh, a wizard that'll walk you through some of the basics, and that gets you about 90% of the way there um, for full operation. There are a couple changes you need to tweak afterwards, and you, of course, can also cancel out of this and just go in and manually configure it. It's going to prompt you for some key information. First, it's going to be a display name. Um, as a reminder on the TOUC, when a call is placed, the inbound call will take a look at the um, at the display name that's offered by the endpoint, but if it's a user that's in the system, whatever is set in their user profile for display name is going to be sent internally. So uh, unlike other systems, display name isn't as important uh, because we will standardize that on the server side, so it doesn't have to come in from the endpoint too much. The username itself is going to be the extension. In this case, I'm using a test system and my extension is 121. It's going to ask for a SIP server domain or host. Um, in this particular case, because we want to set the domain to be your tenant, um, we're going to go ahead and put in TO on a on-premises deployment or a um, dedicated cloud instance. This will just be TO for a multi-tenant deployment or a shared cloud instance. This is going to be the tenant domain associated with your customer. This just makes sure it goes to the right place, uses the proper authentication, and properly formats its registration of invites. And then we're going to go ahead and set a SIP server port. If you leave it at zero, it's going to default to 5060. Uh, for this test system, I'm running 5066, so I'm going to go ahead and set that accordingly. It's going to ask you for your SIP server username. This is the same on the TO system as your extension, so you can actually leave this blank or you can um, fill it in just like we have here. Um, as long as it's the same extension value, it'll work. And then this is the SIP password that you'd retrieve off of a um, user's profile under the device settings. Voicemail phone number is pound. And then the last one is an operator hard phone number. This is a feature that at this time we generally don't recommend and don't deploy, but it does allow the uh, for the remote control capabilities in some cases. By leaving this blank, we're telling it that we want to use the voice operator panel as a soft phone, uh, which is usually the easiest um, method to configure, to deploy, and to support. So we're going to leave that blank for now. I'm also going to skip over some other information. You can actually set it up on um, with a mail client so that it can tie into email as well. So I'm not going to touch that in this particular case. Um, if that is something that is of interest, do reach out. We can always um, plan more follow-ups here. And then for today's session, I'm going to leave these as default, but if there's particular audio settings that you want it to inherit when it starts up, you can come through and set these here rather than having to um, set those each time on boot, and it'll remember that through here. So it's going to configure and launch at this point. Uh, you'll also get a prompt for if you have an Office 365 account, because with that case, not only can it tie into email, it can also tie into shared calendars and the like. So there's a lot of power that they've added in with, with more recent versions. Um, again, today we're going to be focused primarily on phone traffic, so I'm going to leave that off. And then, um, as I mentioned in the licensing section, this is going to give you a 30-day grace period or trial period. If you want to um, try this out or uh, initially get it configured before you go ahead and license it, so we're just going to go ahead and request trial and then 
Uh, fun. This is the uh, the fun part of doing things live. Give me just a moment here. All right, so we're going to keep this going with an unlicensed copy for today because we can still run through most of the configuration elements on here. Um, as a note, just to kind of give some background on what's going on, I built this up um, ahead of time and then I've reverted uh, so that when it goes to request the um, evaluation license, it shows that it was already in use. Um, this isn't something you're going to run into in the field because this is a, um, you shouldn't be deploying this generally on a virtual machine. You're going to be running this locally on whatever client your operator is running with but it'll still let us configure everything and get it built through so we're going to proceed here uh, as always um, i do recommend you know trying things out for yourself so i'll walk you through how to configure everything um, if you want to try out a trial as well and again um, we can make that link available um, and it's also going to be in the recorded presentation so when you first log in to the voice operator panel you're going to get a list of all your settings and it can be quite overwhelming. But where we need to start, it's just gonna be account. This is your SIP account that's associated with the device. We've already set up a display name and username. We've got a voicemail number set up here and we've got our domain. We do need to add in the SIP server address, uh, which is not prompted in the wizard. So that is something that always needs to be added in. Uh, that can be your fully qualified domain name. That can be uh, a DNS SRV record, or that can be an IP address. I um, always recommend using DNS where, where available. It makes it a lot easier if uh, things ever have to change in the future, because you can point that record somewhere else and continue working with it, whether that's DNS SRV or just a standard host name record. Uh, there's benefits to both, just depending on timing. If you are using DNS SRV rather than explicitly setting a port like so, we'll leave that as a zero to tell it to use the default port. Uh, for this type of deployment, generally you're gonna to want to keep with a UDP connection uh, because that's the fastest connection time, but it does also support TCP and TLS deployments. As a reminder, if you're using TLS, generally um, you're going to need to increment your port by one because that is a separate port to make sure that all traffic over it is encrypted on here um, we do not recommend using the older dns snapter uh, standards or, or doing anything with that so we'd recommend just keeping with dns srv if you'd like to provide service records on there we've already got the sip server username filled out and again if it's left empty it's just going to inherit the username from above and we've already put our password in here it's going to give us an option for um, explicitly setting a registration of our or an expiration of our registrations we're going to leave that as zero which is the same as just most endpoints where when a registration request comes in this the server is going to come back and say here's how long you're valid for here's where you expire for and then by default it's going to leave sip server pings uh, this is generally going to be a sip options message um, enabled so that it can track latency track quality and keep um, any natted ports open and mapped. 
presence or for your presence type, we recommend switching to um, presence because we can provide a richer um, report and richer details through here, but we can leave the presence prefix and the presence resource list empty. Um, other values we can take a look at is a call intercept code for directed call pickup. If you put star zero in there, it can automatically bring that into a contact list. And then uh, star zero and then a dollar. Pardon me. And for the intercom code, we can do a star five and a dollar sign here so that we can enable that. Um, at this point, we're going to go ahead and save. It'll restart, yell at me about the license again, and then we will keep moving. One thing to note is that every time you save on the voice operator panel settings here, it's going to prompt you for a restart. Um, now, as you saw, it doesn't take very long at all, but um, do keep that in mind if you're trying to put changes in while it is active. Other settings to take a look at while we're on here. I'll just run through these very quickly. Uh, just for your familiarity we've got operator controls again we want to leave this operator hard phone number empty if you set a value in there when the call comes in it's going to immediately receive a redirect to that other extension and it can throw you off for call handling um, so highly recommend leaving that empty um, it, yeah, just to keep things simple when we're in that state again we will just use this as a soft phone soft phone settings here let you control input output and speakers so it can have options for bringing over a headset for a speakerphone mode are all built in through here and it does have noise reduction and active um, echo canceller capabilities um, if you need to handle usb settings you can do it through here and it can also even tie in with a usb light or loud ringer so there's some additional capabilities through here global calls just configures how um, they're displayed both on incoming and outgoing calls, and we'll continue to touch on that as we move through here. Uh, so it's going to show you how long, by default, it's going to show you the total call duration. If you've put someone on hold, which you can do uh, simply by answering the call and then either double clicking it or right clicking and select hold, it will keep that um, held otherwise, or it'll show you how long they've been on hold for. And then we can actually trigger a visual warning as well. So by default, if the user of this uh, operator panel has left someone on hold for more than two minutes. It's going to actually start flashing and giving a visual warning. Uh, it doesn't change the behavior. It'll keep them on hold, but it does say, hey, this person's been on hold for a while. Uh, we do server side uh, music on hold, so there's no need to set a music on hold sound file here, so we can keep that empty. Incoming calls, you can customize the appearance of how it comes through. So. Do we want to reject certain call types? Uh, generally, this is going to be set to none. We don't want to reject calls. The whole point of this position is to accept calls, but you do have some, some flexibility there if needed. Uh, you can configure whether this window pops up and comes to the front on an inbound call or whether you just get a toast alert. You can configure auto answer and enable auto answer on here as well. Uh, Depending on call volumes, sometimes that can be a little overwhelming. So uh, that's something that the user themselves is generally going to pick whether that's a feature they would like to have rather than uh, something that you'd recommend up front. You can, of course, change the ringer. By default, it's just going to be a standard US or Belcor ring, uh, but you can override that. So if they want different audio files, point to all of those. Uh, you can also blacklist callers through here. Again, most of that because we run everything through the UC, we'd recommend handling anything like that on the UC side instead, but it is possible to support here as well. Um, same thing with outgoing calls. Generally, we want to just leave these uh, as basic as can be, which is we just log those outgoing calls so that they'll be showing up in our call log later. One thing I do want to point out here, though, is that we can actually add in a web request. And so we can actually trigger a web request on an outbound call. Um, this is going to be something that can be very powerful, um, but it the specifics of how you use it are going to be varied based on the platform you're talking with. Speaking of platforms, we can also tie into CRM with this uh, using a Git or a post 
call, um, you need to provide in the URL to pull, and then it references the variables you need. So if you have a CRM or your customer has a CRM where you can provide a uh, either the caller ID name or caller ID number, so uh, name is going to be that dollar D uh, number is going to be that dollar U sign that they reference here. We can actually have it open that URL either in a dedicated window or open it in an existing browser tab. Uh, we can control how that handles. You can control when that triggers. Um, again, it's going to vary. Specifics are going to vary based on both the your customer needs and based on um, your uh, the CRM platform they're working with, but it is supported there. Uh, one thing, and I'll see if I can pull up a video for it since uh, the licensing issue we ran into with this training this morning is going to prevent me from showing it to you live, is that in terms of call handling, we make or it's, it's available for drag and drop. So this is on by default. Generally, um, you'd only turn this off if the dragging and dropping features are causing issues for a uh, receptionist or operator. They're saying, you know, this is just harder. or I'm getting to the wrong place. We can disable it so that um, they don't accidentally drag and drop something. Not a common thing, but it's a nice accessibility option if needed. Uh, what this lets you do is it lets you take an incoming call or connected outgoing call and then drag it over to a list of contacts that are pulled in from uh, Active Directory, for example, or a local contact directory. Pull it over there and it'll immediately transfer that call. Um, again, that's where we can see that volume, where we can see that speed of ha call handling. Shortcuts, just like a lot of the rest of the system, is highly configurable, but generally can be left um, as defaults unless something comes up that needs to handle differently. Um, there are a ton of keyboard shortcuts built into this, so if you've got those real power users who want to do everything without their hands leaving the keyboard, we can support that on here as well. Um, so that includes the ability to transfer a call, hang up a call, take a call off of hold, put a call on hold, all handled through uh, through the keyboard rather than using the mouse. There are customization options for the appearance, including different theme colors to match what the uh, preference on whether you're light mode or dark mode, for example, you can adjust fonts. Uh, again, we, this is really flexible in order to make it easy for uh, you to tailor to your customer and your users needs. A couple things I do want to call out on this is um, the lock windows layout. Because this is so customizable, a lot of what will happen is um, this will change slowly over time. But by locking the windows layout on here, it prevents anything from getting resized. So without that being uh, set, I can actually come through and I can resize or I can drag and merge my calls together in a way that might throw me off. So uh, it's really useful for customization. I'll go over that in a minute, but um, generally once something's locked in the way that you're planning on supporting your customer, I come in here and I do that lock windows layout so it's not moving on you later. Um, we're only going to really talk about US deployments and Canadian deployments today, but it is localized into a large number of different environments. Um, gives you a lot of other control for how things run through, how it handles on startup. Um, I'm not going to touch some of the items down here at the bottom in terms of the Outlook, Office 365, and LDAP integration at this point. Um, very powerful, very customizable, uh, but outside of the scope of what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, the last thing that I um, want to highlight very quickly here is there's a feature on here that allows it to control transfers. It's been moved in this version. Give me just a moment. Uh, it's, it's not where my notes show it. I will come back to that one on here, um, but one of the things that this allows us to do is it um, has the ability to let a receptionist queue up 
transferred calls. So let's say I've got five calls coming in here and they're going out to different destinations. And some of those destinations, I actually see that the user is on the phone. In a case like that, um, the soft or the voice operator panel here can be configured to uh, take the call, put it on hold, and then watch the present status of the transfer destination. Once that transfer destination has been back to an available state for a configurable length of time, by default, I believe that's five seconds, it will then transfer the call over. If we disable that, it'll send the call over immediately, allowing it to ring through with call waiting on a secondary line appearance or go to voicemail or wherever else that might end up. We're gonna talk a little bit next about some basic operations on here. Uh, so we talked about settings. I'm gonna go ahead and apply a couple changes on here. Uh, again, you can tweak almost everything we're looking at for what your customer is after. Incoming calls are gonna show up in this list just vertically stacked through here by default. Um, this can be reconfigured, resized as needed. So depending on call volumes, we can make this a very large screen or we can make it a very small screen. Outgoing calls are the same thing. Because with an operator position, a large number of the calls that are being made are either being made as transfers for outgoing uh, which would generally be a drag and drop again into a contact or a right click select the transfer option or they're going to be to a known contact it keeps things relatively um, pared down so to make an outbound call that's not to a contact on here you'll just mouse over this um, text entry field at the bottom uh, and then you can hit enter or hit the call button on here we can also configure this from being a list view to a table view. Just again, one of those places you can control how much density and how much information is on there. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you're going to see your status. So present status and whether you're on do not disturb or not can be configured through here. It'll manage server lat latency, so it can tell you, are you well connected and responsive to the server? Are you potentially having network issues? Voicemail access is one click away. Missed calls, if you click that, it's going to take you to your call log here and show you a list of missed calls. If they need to change anything about their input or output, all through here, you get your statistics about number of current incoming calls, outgoing calls, and held calls are all through here. Let's talk a little bit more about customization and we'll dive in. Um, the first uh, I wanna call out is, as you see when it comes up here, we've built out a local and a contacts list. Local is going to be a, um, for lack of a better word, locally maintained contact list that can either be, um, unlock that here, that can either be imported via XML, vCard, CSV file, um, and can also be exported as well. We can also, if we'd rather come in and not do a full directory, uh, we can uh, create one we can create individual users here. One other thing I do want to call out is that we can actually point this to an external directory as well. So um, if there's a case where a your customer already has an external directory in an XML format, it can be pointed at that and actually import that live and it will pull on startup. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to work with these. For right now, I'm going to talk just about the um, internal view. By default, it's going to be in this card appearance where you have the options to see mobile numbers, home numbers if needed, um, email, web links, and all of that can be brought in. We can modify this, set that all up. Um, we can enable presence, and if presence is enabled, which can also be enabled um, on an import, so it's not, have, not having to be done manually each time. Um, it will subscribe to presence, give you live updates on it so you can see the status. Okay, are they on hold? Or are they on a call? Are they off a call? Are they busy? So you can know whether it's safe to transfer the call or not. The bottom of the screen here, you have a search option where you can search a number of different fields. Uh, generally, it's gonna be phone number or name is what we see searched through here, but you can search anything that is built into the contact list. From here again, if we want to add in or rename things, we can do that all through here. 
Let's go ahead and add a new user. Only thing we need to uh, manage a um, new user is going to be a phone number. You'll notice that when I set that up, it immediately enabled presence as well. But we can bring in any of this other information. Again, doing this by hand and doing it manually is okay if an operator is maintaining a local contact list that they want to work with, but it's not something that um, would be a best practice. Generally, bringing that in from a CSV or um, importing from an external source is going to be a lot more efficient. You can also change your layout. So right now we're looking at this as the table or it card list. We can go to a straight list view instead. Gives you a lot more density because sometimes it can be harder to find or harder to work with. Again, it comes up to what your users want. The, the whole purpose of this voice operator panel as a product is to let you customize it to what's going to make the operator the most efficient. So uh, in a lot of cases, you're going to see this differs based on your user. And that is okay. That's what it's built for. So you got your table view, which again is your default card style view. You've got that list view, and then you have a tree view where you can get the names and then expand it open to see more information. You can change what your default is. So in most cases, we want a default to go into the phone, but this can be configured to default to go into a mobile number, for example, um, going direct to voicemail. That can all be configured through here. Uh, we can filter out various things. So if I don't need to see something, let's say, you know, I don't really care about seeing the web. I can just remove that from here. You've got a little uh, help legend about what the different states you're going to see. So right now, since I haven't registered this soft phone or this voice operator panel as a soft phone, um, it doesn't show the present states, but it is visible for uh, on here. So you can see the different things that will display and you just got a total user count. Once this is populated up, this is a, the key part of your workflow is handling an inbound call, answering it, finding out where it's going to go, drag and dropping or right clicking and selecting that transfer option uh, to get it to the right location. We can also tie into contacts though. So we were talking about local uh, directories here. And again, those can be manually created like I did with that demo, or they can be imported from a, an external source. Contacts, we skipped over it today because I didn't import um, an Office 365 account or a, um, <coughs> pardon me, or a different um, mail client. But um, this can import from Outlook, this can import from Office 365, this can import from an IMAP server, for example. So that can be built out whatever contacts the operator has. Um, in the account they're configured for. And this doesn't have to be the same as the operator's own personal or, or dedicated email. It could be a shared one, uh, depending on the needs of the customer. Call logs on here. Uh, by default, it's going to show each call inbound, outbound. Just like with those contact lists, we can filter those. So, you know, I only want to see, I don't want to see any calls that I've rejected, or I don't want to see any calls I forwarded, only, only ones that have actually come through here. You've got the same helper legend as you're going to see throughout and it is searchable at the bottom of this here in order to work with this um, i've been using their default settings so far i'm going to come back over i am going to reset my window layout to get it back the way i want it and then we can take a little bit of a look at how we can customize this further when we're not locked like i just unlocked here i can come through and i can drag these different tabs around to rearrange. So I can say, you know what? I really want my call log in its own dedicated window. So there I got my contact list, I got my call log. Or I might say, you know what? I want to have my contacts below so I can see my online contacts, I can see my local contacts, and I can customize that through. Um, another common case might be, you know, I don't really need to see a lot of. Um, my outgoing calls here, so I'm going to put my call log directly beneath my live calls here and then shrink down my outgoing calls to give me some more visibility. Very flexible, very customizable. What you do is you grab, when you go to drag and drop, you'll see your selectors here. So I can say, 
if I hover over an existing window, I can make it merge into part of it. I can make it merge and add as a tab in here. Or if I go more widely, I can have it as a new window below, above or to the side. Uh, again, just like we were talking about with your views and the contact lists, uh, there's no one right answer for how to do this. This is entirely based around what makes sense for the users. So it's going to look a little different based on a personal preference, but what we want to make sure you know how to do is once this is set, you can come in here and lock. Once it's locked, you're not going to change this during normal operations. This is the same as that lock windows layout button here. So because there's so much drag and dropping going on, you want to make sure that once this is laid out the way you want for the time being, <coughs> that we do lock this. Otherwise, you run into a case where someone's handling a call and they misclick and suddenly their outgoings in the wrong section. All recoverable, all easy to manage and get back from, but it can really throw a user off in the middle of it. Uh, one other element I want to leave us with today, and then I will um, switch over to talking about what we've got upcoming next, as well as an opportunity for questions if there are any, is I do want to just mention. You know, I talked about contact imports. I talked about local uh, XML based directories. LDAP or Active Directory can also tie in here with multiple different authentication methods. Uh, we can filter out specific user types, specific contacts, and we can use that to load everything that you'd see in a local present or a local uh, directory. Most important one I found is to make sure that we get both the local phone field. So this is going to be the extension the presence field and then enable presence for all LDAP users in a case where we're running with a active directory or other domain controller that offers LDAP this can <clears throat> make it trivial to tie in and get all your contacts loaded at once um, highly recommended for larger systems where you uh, don't want to have to put that burden of maintaining contact lists on the user or going through, say, a, an Office 365 account. Uh, you can do a search on demand. You can have it cache instead. Uh, again, very flexible, very customizable. Uh, I do want to, before we um, move on, I want to thank everybody for for joining today. Uh, I do apologize for the the hiccup with the license here. Uh, that teaches me. Uh, a lesson for next time, but um, I hope this was useful and beneficial to you. Again, if you do want to try this out on your own, highly recommend it. Um, you will have a 30 day um, license available to you. Just don't revert your system just before your training class so you can show it again because it will think you're trying to uh, to pull a fast one and stop you from uh, from bringing it up without a license. Uh, if you've got any questions about this or anything else, please. Uh, never hesitate to reach out. Uh, we're always here to help. Um, upcoming, we're going to continue to talk about third party devices over the next couple of weeks with um, examples on conference phones, paging adapters, door phones, wireless phones. So if you have particular use cases that you'd like us to cover more formally in one of these trainings, please let us know. Happy to adapt and include that in here. After we're finished our tour of devices, we're going to move on to reporting and have um, some deeper dives into not only how to build reports, generate reports, but also how to interpret them and work with them to improve call flows uh, and efficiency. So again, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, if you have any questions, happy to take them now. Otherwise, I'll let everybody get a few minutes back in their day, and we'll talk to you next week.